In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. We have come to the end of yet another year. Not quite yet the calendar year. We still have a handful of weeks to go until we turn the calendar to 2018. But we have come to the end of the liturgical year, or the church year. And next Sunday we'll begin a new liturgical year with the start of Advent. As we come to this final Sunday of this church year, the church presents us with an apocalyptic gospel. The word apocalypse basically means a revelation or a manifestation. And we use this word to describe, in particular, the revelation or manifestation of Christ's return, his second coming, as Christ the King overall. All three synoptic gospels, that is, the gospels of Saints Matthew, Mark, and Luke, record details related to the apocalypse or apocalypses. St. John, the beloved apostle, devoted an entire work based on the mystical vision and revelation given to him about matters related to last things and the return of Jesus Christ. The Apostle St. Paul, in some of his writings, describes certain aspects or details related to the apocalypse. No doubt the church in her wisdom presents us with an apocalyptic reading on the last Sunday of the church year, because each year as we turn a new calendar, whether it be the secular calendar or whether it be the church calendar, we tend to look back on the previous year, but we also tend to look forward in time. We've come to the end of something that is cyclical. In a sense, the church is asking us to reflect upon not just the end of the year, but the end of all time. And there will be an end to all time. When? We do not know for certain. Though Christ, through the various apocalyptic writings, provides us with enough details to recognize these signs as leading up to the final apocalypse. Now the Gospel reading of this Mass was taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew. The Church Fathers recognized that while Jesus in one sense is speaking about the final apocalypse, he was also speaking about an apocalypse that took place about 40 years after his crucifixion. The apocalypse or the manifestation of the power of Christ upon what had been the center of true religion, the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple. Christ lamented over that city and temple lamented and forewarned of its destruction, going so far as to say that not a stone will be left upon a stone of one of the wonders of the world, the Jewish temple. Some of you may have visited Jerusalem and seen what remains of the Jewish temple and think to yourself, well, there are still stones upon stones the fact is, those stones were the foundation stones under the earth to support the temple above. 
No stone remains upon a stone of what had been the actual temple. In its place now is a Muslim shrine, and it is controlled by infidels. What happened and what brought about this apocalypse upon the city of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jewish temple? It was the apostasy in large part of the old covenant people, misled by wicked leaders who were proud and self-serving, impelled by zealots who represented themselves as messiahs or leaders of messianic movements. Following the crucifixion of Christ, tension rose and continued to rise between these elements of Judaism and the Roman Empire, such that in the 60s, some 30 years after Christ, an actual rebellion took place led by the Zikarim, the zealots among the Jews who carried daggers under their cloaks in order to stab even fellow Jews who opposed this movement. In a sense, it was a suicidal movement that had little chance of success against the empire of Rome. And once the revolutionaries had seized control of the city of Jerusalem, Rome began to march toward the Holy Land. Beginning in the northern regions, Galilee in particular, bloody battles ensued. Josephus, a Jewish historian, describes in great detail the elements of this apocalypse. He describes the Sea of Galilee as being so filled with the blood of the ships that did battle on it that the color of the water was changed to blood red. And so many bodies floated from the Sea of Galilee into the Jordan River that it was dammed up and the waters were stopped. And then the Roman forces moved south and eventually arrived at the city of Jerusalem. Inside those city walls were over one million Jews. There were no Christians within those walls. They knew of the signs of the impending apocalypse. Jesus had warned them. And they had fled to the east or were missionaries elsewhere in the world and living in the authentic covenant of Christ. Rome laid siege to that city. Its inhabitants stubbornly refused to give up. They were starving inside. Violence ensued. Cannibalism took place. Finally, Rome broke down the walls. The city was looted. Men, women, children, it didn't matter. They were all slaughtered. The temple was looted was desecrated, not a stone was left upon a stone. For all those inhabitants of that once holy city, which had gone into apostasy by a stubborn and obstinate rejection of Christ in the new covenant, it was the end of their world. And it was the end of a former covenant time that was no longer pleasing to God. God no longer intended animals to be sacrificed in that temple. The one true sacrifice, the Lamb of God, had already been offered in Christ on the cross. Sadly, if the leadership and mainstream Judaism had embraced Christ as the Messiah and embraced the new and final covenant, to this day, Jerusalem would probably be the center of the church and the temple would be our greatest cathedral. But it was not to be. So this is the backdrop to a final apocalypse. In a sense, what happened to the city of Jerusalem will one day happen to the entire world. 
Will it happen in our lifetimes? Perhaps. Perhaps not for those of us that are more senior. Perhaps for children and grandchildren, they will live to see it. It won't happen so suddenly that it will be a matter of hours or even weeks. But it could be months. It could be a handful of years. The apocalyptic writings warn us of signs that nature will turn against us as never before. That there will be a massive apostasy of the faithful. That there will be conversions to true religion all the while that there is this apostasy taking place. There will be prophets, false prophets, but also true prophets who will preach Christ and prepare for his coming. There will rise an antichrist, more powerful than any before, who will lead the fallen world and the apostates to himself. And then Christ will return, and he will destroy his enemies, and he will bring his saints to heaven. And this world and all time will pass. Are we in apocalyptic times? Yes. It is happening around us. There is massive falling away of Catholics. Statistics prove it. There is heterodoxy. There is even heresy coming even from the heights of the church, misleading many of the families, the faithful. The Antichrist, even now, might be in the world, but perhaps not. The point is, whether or not the final apocalypse will happen in our lifetime, we do not know. But as Jerusalem was a prelude to the final, so there can be others before the final end. In a matter of years, Europe will have changed from once Christian to infidels, probably dominated by Muslims. That's an apocalypse. That's a change of a world and an end of a world. And we were only one election away from that happening in rapid order here in our own nation. And it still is likely to happen unless hearts and souls are changed and Christ the King is embraced by the world, by society, and by our leaders. It's a sobering thought. It should also be comforting for those who are following in the footsteps of Christ, remaining within the bosom of the church. Do not be among those who are misled. Do not be among those who fall away. Persevere in the faith, as St. Paul writes. God provides us with the grace and he will provide us with the insight to recognize the signs around us so that we will remain firmly rooted in Christ when the end does come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.